Frankly, this was, I believe, the greatest political movement of all time. There's never been anything like this in this country, and maybe beyond. While I concede this election, I do not concede the fight that fueled this campaign. Donald Trump is back. Kamala Harris is promising a smooth transition to say the United States is in a different political universe to where it was four years ago is an understatement. So what's led to this extraordinary political comeback? Why have American voters decided to return to Donald Trump? And what happens next? I'm David Spears in Washington. Welcome to Insiders on Background. Now, in fact, I'm sitting on the balcony here in Washington where we were during our election night broadcast overlooking the Capitol building where Congress sits. And I'm joined by Lester Munson, who joined us during that broadcast for an interview. And you were so interesting. I wanted to bring you back for some further analysis on the lay of the land now that we know the clear result. Uh, Lester worked on Capitol Hill for more than 25 years as an advisor to uh, various Republicans. Um, you were a staff director at the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. I want to get to some foreign relations uh, too. Uh, you're now uh, with the government relations firm BGR Group and also the US Studies Centre that people in Australia would know. Look, um, first, Lester, how would you describe the reaction to Trump's victory, particularly here in Washington? I think it was, uh, there was a little bit of shock, particularly at Trump winning the popular vote. This was not really foreseen by many folks. Uh, Republicans haven't won the popular vote for 20 years. Uh, people viewed Kamala Harris, maybe even if she was a weak candidate, she was probably going to repeat the Democrats' pattern of winning the popular vote and then having kind of a shaky uh, attempt at winning the Electoral College. They did not foresee Donald Trump winning the, this popular vote by four points. So I think, in a way, while it's shocking to a lot of people, it helps with the transition because it's a clear win. It's a clear win for Trump, and I think that's going to help uh, the, the party currently in power, the Democrats, maybe come to some sort of peace with this and, and reflect on the things that they're going to have to do to change it up to be competitive in the next And election. I want to come to that, but how important was it for Kamala Harris to do what she did and, uh, well, uh, have a conversation with Donald Trump to concede defeat and then give a speech, which, yes, talked about fighting on for the things they fought for during the campaign, but also make it very clear to supporters who would be upset that we've got to respect this outcome. We've got to respect our democratic process. How important was that? I, th I think critically important. It was, a, it was perhaps, a, if you were to be critical, you'd say it was a little late. She could have perhaps done, done it a little bit earlier. Yeah. But I think that's okay. These are, you know, these are strange times mm -hmm. here in Washington and the United States politically. Uh, but I think she absolutely did the right thing. And, and kudos to her for you know, taking that stand. There's probably a lot of people in her party who wanted to see her fight a little bit more, but realistically... But with the results. With the, the no results, way. it was yeah. not it was not plausible. And then there's a bit of moral high ground there too, I suppose, isn't there? Yeah. We respect the institutions of democracy and this is how election uh, power should be transitioned. They're immediately starting the contrast <laughs> yeah, with the guy right. who defeated them. Yeah. So, look, just coming back to the result itself, what happened? How did Trump put together this majority? Uh, well, I think people are going to write PhD theses on this in, in the future. So I don't, I don't know that there's a there's an easy answer to his success. He won in all, not just the popular vote, but in also every, all seven of the targeted states where people thought the Electoral College was really going to play out. He went from Arizona all the way to Pennsylvania in these, these seven key battlegrounds. He won with, uh, he won, he did better than people thought with the youth vote with uh, Hispanic Americans, with black Americans, with older Americans. And what's going on there? Across the board. Why, this is fascinating, why has he boosted the Republican vote amongst Latino and African American voters in particular? This is significant. Right, so we, we were talking about this a little bit earlier. I think it's because this is almost a class warfare model, and it's not what you would have expected 20 years ago. The Republicans have now become, in a lot of ways, the party of the working class and have really embraced the idea that they're for the people against the elites. And the Democrats seem to have been caught flat-footed by this whole argument. They've thought of themselves as the party of the people for a very long time. They talk about economic policies that benefit the working class and unions and things like that. Trump has kind of switched things up on them. And so the, the Democrats might go get the endorsement of the leadership of a union, but Trump's going to win the vote of the hard hats, you know, the, the regular guys and gals who work for that, who work in that union. He's going to overwhelmingly win that union And this vote. has been a, a gradual shift, certainly over the Trump era, 
but it's it's a it's an enormous shift. I mean, we're talking about the party of the workers, the Democrats that have been the party of the workers for decades and decades, right? right? right. So this gets to the soul searching they need to do. How are they losing that working class? What are they getting wrong? Well, I think there's I think there's two issues, and Democrat it's a trade off for Democrats. They've embraced a lot of climate change issues, understandably so, but they're going to lose part of the working class when they do that. If they're opposed to energy development and infrastructure development, you're kind of naturally trading off some of the working class votes for that. Blue collar jobs. Blue blue collar jobs, exactly. Construction jobs, uh, industry, manufacturing. Also on, you know, I think it's easy to overstate this and I don't want to, but a lot of the hot button social issues, what we would call the kind of woke issues, I think Democrats probably took that a little bit farther than they needed to. And this is this is perhaps a little bit of a break for them to kind of come back to the mainstream. There's a lot of kind of regular middle class parents who are concerned about how their kids are being treated in school and what the, the issues that are being presented to them. And I, and I it, my sense is, as, as someone who brought up kids in the public school system here in this country, that uh, Trump presented a more rational approach to to those issues than the Democrats. I mean, the, the Trump campaign openly targeted in their advertising the transgender issue, right? right? Are you right. saying that actually is, is hurting the Democrats? I think I think it is. And that's a and the wherever you think about transgender issues and there are and it's a very complex issue that was seen as kind of a symbolic issue on a lot of fronts. And so the, he kind of made it this esoteric question of, you know, Democrats are paying for people to transition in prison. Like, they're using taxpayer dollars to pay for transitions of people in prison as a way to highlight some of the absurdities of the issue. And I think that played to his advantage. And the polling, the, evidently the internal polling for the Trump campaign really showed that. We know the Harris campaign also devoted a lot of attention to the abortion issue, and that was seen throughout the campaign as a really smart idea that was really causing a lot of grief on the Republican side and would bring out uh, women in particular and, and, and see this gender divide uh, grow. Did that happen in the end? Did women turn out for Kamala Harris? So I th- they did, and she won, she won the gender gap with women, but yeah. Trump won the gender gap with men. So what was, the, what was the cost of highlighting that issue as kind of your primary argument against Trump? Did she lose the ability to then make, to instead make the economic argument the number one argument? That's the thing at national level vote for president. Americans are voting on their pocketbook and voting on the economy and whether they think this, pres- this candidate or that candidate is going to do a better job of managing the economy for them for the next four years, that's the most important thing. Yes, abortion is a real issue and it's to the Democrats' advantage, but if they make it their number one priority, it's probably a mistake. One of the PhD theses about this election will no doubt be on the communication channels that were used, because I find this fascinating too. I mean, Trump said no to the 60 Minutes interview, for example, and that's a, that's a you know, Australian viewers might not be aware, but here, this is an institution, yes. you do, everyone does this in a campaign. Um, he did a uh, podcast, Joe Rogan, three-hour right. chat with Joe Rogan. He had Elon Musk by his side, and that communication channel was clearly really important uh, as well. Has that played a role in the outcome here too, do you think? I think so. And I would, I would bring up the Al Smith dinner in New York, which is a, a traditional venue for presidential candidates. It's, a, it's kind of a Catholic-oriented event for those candidates to talk about, uh, to, to tell jokes about each other and show kind of some camaraderie and good spirit and, you know, willingness to poke each other a little bit. And Kamala Harris skipped that dinner. Trump went uh, and told some pretty good jokes, at least that I saw, and was making fun of Chuck Schumer, who's a big Democrat, sitting right in front of him, and they seemed to be having a nice time. She kind of missed an opportunity there. I think overall, on the, on the media question, Trump picked opportunities to show he's the insurgent change candidate. He's against the ossified old systems of the elites in this country. Kamala Harris had the opportunity to do that also, and she chose not to take it. I mean, he's the change candidate. He's also the shock factor candidate. We can't ignore the fact that, you know, here's someone who denied the outcome of the election result four years ago, was, you know, facing all sorts of charges, was convicted, you know, felony conviction over the hush money payment, uh, was talking about um, uh, seeking retribution against enemies and not to mention all the language around his campaign, particularly that Madison Square Gardens event, racist stuff, misogynistic stuff. In the end, explain, explain to us why that didn't matter. 
Well, I think people, you know, Trump's been, uh, you know, I'm not a fan of Trump, and I recognize these deep flaws, and they, a lot of them concern me, to be totally honest. But I think the reason people, a lot of, a majority of Americans ended up voting for him is he's been, known, he's been a known quantity in this country for a very long time. He's a genuine celebrity. He was on TV on his apprentice show for 13, 14 years. People know him. They've seen him. He's got credibility with them. They know he goes off the reservation and is willing to be provocative on these topics. And I don't think they really care. And I think they see it, if, if, and if they do notice it, they see it as a demonstration of him being willing to break the mold and kind of throw out the old models and I'm going to shake things up. I'm going to say some things that irritate you and maybe even offend you, but I'm going to do that to, sh to shake up the U.S., to, to take, shake up the federal government, which you don't have a very good opinion of, which all of the polls show. And that anger that he projects uh, clearly was reflected in the, the mood of the electorate when it comes to cost of living and how angry they are about the, the, the pressure they're under. Look, what about uh, this building behind us? Um, where we're at with the count now, the Republicans have taken the Senate. What happens in the House? Still up in the air as of right now. I think uh, uh, last night, we, which was election night, we thought looked like the Democrats could hold on. Now, 24 hours later, it looks like the Republicans might end up with a one or two vote majority. I think we're not probably not going to find out for another two or three days. Okay. Uh, that means they that might have both houses? Republicans might have both houses. That would, that would unleash a lot of domestic, uh, opportuni do domestic issue opportunities for President Trump. He could change tax policy. He could change the budget. Uh, he, could ch he could cut back on certain things. He could increase the defense budget. If Democrats end up uh, prevailing in the House and flip the House in their direction, he'll be much more limited in what he can do in terms of domestic policy right. because both houses, of course, have to pass any law. And if Democrats control the House, they'll be able to block him on any number of issues. If the Republicans control both houses, will that mean he's even more unconstrained? In, in a lot of ways, yes, but he'll still, he'll still need on tax policy, he'll still need Congress to write the law for him and to, and to come up with something that, that makes sense and to go through all of the negotiations they need to go through. I promise you, that is not easy to do, no, no. <laughs> even when it is one-party control. Are there still moderate Republicans, though, in Congress willing to push back at Trump? There are, I wouldn't call them necessarily moderates. I think it's actually the... The folks who are the true conservatives are going to be the ones pushing back on Trump. And in the Senate, you'll find those as the kind of the mainstream, international-minded Republicans, a Jim Risch, a Mitch McConnell, who, who though, although he's stepping down from his leadership role, remains in the Senate. Uh, some of these other kind of traditional Republicans. And then in the House, uh, the Freedom Caucus, which is a, kind of a libertarian uh, caucus of about 40 or 50 Republicans, they may also give Trump some trouble because they don't like big budgets. They don't like big budget deficits. He's, he does not mind a big budget deficit. That's a problem for fiscal hawks and traditional Republicans. And some of this could play out too in uh, getting confirmation for his appointments to cabinet and other positions. Um, how will uh, President Trump Mark II differ, do you think, to President Trump Mark I? So he's, on day one, he's a lame duck. He's, everyone knows he can't run for re-election unless somebody decides to change the Constitution, which is even harder than you, than you may imagine. Uh, so that doesn't seem realistic. So he's, he's going to be a lame duck. He's not going to run for re-election. His, his political power will only fade over time. He'll start off strong because he won the election and he did it in a convincing fashion. But I, every day that goes by, he'll have less and less influence, particularly over congressional Republicans. And once the the, the off-year election in 2026 passes, he will, he will have very little role, I would say, compared to now in the future of that party. And so look to J.D. Vance, the vice, the vice president-elect, and perhaps his competitors like Nikki Haley to really be setting the agenda. But won't his extraordinary megaphone still count, uh, even post those midterms? Of course, of course. In some ways, he's still the president, and he's still the most recognized person on the planet, probably, and is... He can still turn the party against a candidate, can he? He can, but it's gonna be, he's going to have less of an interest and less of a willingness to do it, and I suspect you know, he's going to be, uh, I think, 78 when he takes office. He'll be 80 years old by the time this election in 26 happens. He'll be 82 at the end of his term. I have a feeling his energy is going to flag a little bit. We saw this with the current president. Sure did. Uh, so I, I think he's he's going to be he's going to seem like the big man on day one, but not.
for very much longer. Which might suggest that um, if you're right and the power starts to wane, he'll want to be in a hurry to get the big stuff done. We'll see. Turning to foreign policy, what the implications are for the world, particularly us in, in Australia, we're a very close ally of the United right. States. Um, what does it mean for us, do you think? I think it means uh, the basic formula for Trump is he's, he's transactional, he's interested in things that benefit him and his position. Uh, he's less interested in international law or written agreements or something that a previous president may have said. He wants to live in, he's a, he's a bit of a day trader when it comes to these things. And while I don't think he's a real threat to NATO or to AUKUS or to the Quad or anything like that, I do think uh, American allies, let's we'll just say American allies and friends generally, are going to have to have a different approach to the chief executive than they do with President Biden. So he might want to squeeze a bit more out of these agreements. He's, he's going to be looking for um, something that makes him look good in a real kind of base yeah. sense, whether it's a better trade deal or getting paid more for a military base or, uh, you know, just some, maybe someone giving him a fancy set of golf clubs or just talking about how, how great of a host he is or how terrific the hotel looks. Whatever it is, he, he wants someone to kind of shine him up a little bit, and then he's likely to reciprocate. A nice set of golf clubs could uh, go a long way. Fascinating. Um, well, in terms of that negotiating with Trump, he, we know on the trade front he's promised steep tariffs, 10 to 20 percent on the world, 60 percent on China. Is that just a negotiating position, do you think, or is he... Is he going to have to follow I, through on this? Well, I think it was, a, it was a campaign gesture as much as anything. And I think uh, even though he's going to surround himself with protectionists and folks who like tariffs, it's unclear exactly how much of that he'll be able to do on his own and how much he'll need a congressional legislation to help him do those things. The 10 percent across the board tariff is, seems unrealistic to me. Could he do targeted tariffs on certain Chinese products that are related to national security? Yes, and he'd have a lot of support for that. Other things, it's going to be a struggle for him. And climate change action, is that now dead in the water? I think the way the Democrats did it, certainly. But if, you, uh, if folks were following the, the campaign, they'll notice Elon Musk uh, became a very good friend of President Trump during this process. He sells more electric vehicles in this country than I think all of the other companies combined. He himself and, and the work that, he, that Tesla does it has a huge impact on, on climate. And so I think look, I would look to Elon Musk and maybe some of these other, you know, oligarchs of the American yeah. economy to see how they deal with this administration. And can they, can they tease out some, some climate change benefits that maybe are unexpected? And those uh, people like Elon Musk will continue to be close to and influential with Donald Trump? Well, we'll see. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he can be a bit mercurial on yeah. these things. I, and so can Musk. Um, a lot of people think it'll only last for a few weeks. I suspect Musk, Musk's businesses are dependent on the largesse of the federal government, whether it's the space program or the, or the Tesla cars or the other things. So I have a feeling he's going to do what it takes to be in, in, good, in good stead with the president. Well, it's been an extraordinary election outcome. It's going to be a fascinating period ahead, Lester Munson. Thank you so much for talking to it. Really, uh, really appreciate it. If you've got any thoughts on this conversation, any ideas for the podcast, do drop us a line, insiders at abc.net.au. We'll be live here from Washington Sunday morning. Hope to see you then. You're making us all feel very excited about being here.